this uh, afternoon section, so, uh, you know, uh, I hope that you got a good coffee. Uh, so this section is, de is dedicated to sort of the general field of soft matter, and we have uh, two very interesting uh, uh, talks uh, lined up. Uh, the first one is by Emanuela Degado, uh, you know, who is an expert, uh, despite her uh, younger age, has been an you know, important contribution in the field, and, uh, and she's an expert especially in, 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 in the applications of soft matter in material science, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, she will uh, give a, a glimpse of it uh, in, the, in her talk. So please, Manuela, you know, I look forward to your talk, and the floor is all yours without further ado. Hi, uh, thank you for having me and for the invitation. Uh, I'm really delighted. So what I want to talk about uh, is the physics of cement cohesion. So basically it's uh, the, the usual problem we have, right? You take uh, the bag of cement powder that you buy at the store, at the store you mix it with water, and uh, basically within a few hours, it turns from a, a fluid into a solid that is as hard as rock. The powder is what you see here. It's a micrometric powder that it's uh, typically uh, calcium silicate. And uh, by, if you think about it, it's quite remarkable, right? You're at room temperature within a few hours, you get uh, the, the, the water and and, uh, and powder mix turn into a material that is really hard and strong. And it's basically the only material we have to do something like that, to build our infrastructure. So the, the, it is the only material that we have to do this. And there is at present not a really valuable solution, but uh, in fact, it's, it, it is a, a, a material that we need to rediscuss. We need to rediscuss how we produce it and we need to rediscuss how to use it. The reason is that actually uh, building materials uh, uh, and construction materials are responsible for a sizable amount uh, of the whole man-made CO2 and only uh, cement production for concrete uh, is uh, actually responsible for something like uh, up to eight to 10% of the whole uh, CO2 uh, emissions. And, uh, and this is because cement, the powder I told you about, uh, is actually the main binding agent of concrete. So by uh, mixing the cement powder with water, rocks, and sand, that's how we make concrete, which is uh, uh, the main uh, uh, material for infrastructure. So uh, the way this is made uh, to produce the powder, basically you have to burn at very high temperature, uh, calcium carbonate and other minerals that are everywhere on earth, cheap and uh, available everywhere. So that's why uh, this is such a, 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 has been such a successful process uh, and, is, uh, and, used, and it's used uh, uh, as the main resource for uh, our infrastructure. However, this process is very uh, carbon intensive and, uh, and the numbers, the volume of uh, the amount of cement that we need for concrete over the years to, uh, to meet the need of, uh, uh, of uh, maintaining the infrastructure, uh, renovating the infrastructure, and uh, just uh, uh, making uh, bridges, streets, schools, and shelters, uh, they are just uh, 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 they're just going to grow. So the the reason why we do this uh, is because actually the powder, the cal this calcium silicate uh, that we produce by burning uh, mainly calcium carbonate, uh, once you once mixed with water, it immediately dissolves uh, very rapidly. It's very reactive, and from the dissolution of the powder, there is uh, a new material that precipitates uh, as nanoparticles. This material is mainly calcium silicate hydrate. And it's actually uh, extremely sticky. So the nanoparticles stick together very strongly. They progressively densify and they form a gel that rapidly fills the whole space and glues together the different parts of cement and concrete. And this material, it's very uh, messy at the level, you know, at the scale of the gel, where you can see that there is a, a huge uh, uh, range of pore sizes, uh, which are actually very important for the use of the material uh, in the construction. But uh, it's complicated, uh, even at the smaller scale we look at, uh, because even uh, the nanoparticles have a layered structure which is intercalated with water, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and the material in this layer uh, is itself 
quite uh, quite complicated. Bernal was one of the first that recognized that uh, uh, actually uh, this uh, this is uh, a gel formed of this uh, very small unit, and these small units actually resemble uh, a rare a rare mineral called bermorite, but it's which has been uh, so used many times often as a model for this uh, calcium silicate hybrid, but it's, uh, uh, it's uh, with tubermorite, you cannot mix that. So as the gel forms, uh, the, the, the strength of the material evolves. Uh, these are the uh, measurements of using um, um, ultrasound of the modulus uh, in the paste, uh, the shear stiffness in the material that increases, increases uh, in a, a sort of a very non-monotonic way over time, in the sense that uh, there is a first rapid increase, uh, then uh, typically what is called the dormant period, and then uh, the last, uh, the final very strong increase of the material properties where the strength reaches uh, uh, um, values of giga pascal, and that's where basically we, you can walk on it and you can use it uh, to, uh, to, to start the construction. These uh, this, uh, changes in the material are associated to the precipitation of these nanoparticles and the formation of the gel. The precipitation of nanoparticles happen through a reaction that is mainly exothermic, so one can follow the kinetics of the reaction with calorimetry which is what you see here. And so this is where you see that the evolution of the reaction is very non-monotonic. So there is a, a complex kinetics associated to that. And, uh, uh, and But in the end, you get a material that is uh, uh, very strong, remarkably strong. Uh, it's, uh, very, it's still disordered, and it's still uh, very heterogeneous in spite of being very dense. So uh, this is, for example, uh, um, the... Sorry, this is uh, the, um, the scattering intensity measured with uh, neutrons. And so you see that there is this upturn in the scattering intensity of low wave vectors that tells us really that the material, even if it's very dense, this, is, this measurement is done in the hardened phase. So we're basically where most of the gel has completely uh, hardened and densified. And still you get this upturn at low, uh, a low wave vector telling you that the material is still heterogeneous and there is still some interesting correlated structure there. Okay, so what I want to do, it's basically I've articulated my talk uh, around three points. Uh, I want to tell you about what's the origin of the, the, the nanoscale cohesion of the material. Basically, the strength of the material comes from nanoscale forces that, uh, that, uh, that are responsible for the stickiness of the gel to start with, and therefore the gel formation. If we understand that, uh, how can we then understand the growth and the morphology of the gel on larger scales? And then I want to give you a sense of how the things that we, the understanding, the insight that we develop, in fact, can actually help us to understand better and therefore scientifically guide uh, studies of durability and resilience of the, of the material. Basically, what you would like to do is to use less of these materials to, to be able to do more with less. So how can you make the material better? How can you increase the strength and other material properties? How can you design the material to make its mechanical response uh, uh, smarter? And uh, you would like to change the chemistry uh, to avoid, for example, this process, uh, not for example, but that's the main thing, to avoid the process that actually is responsible for uh, this uh, uh, very intensive uh, carbon uh, um, uh, CO2 production. And so uh, to do that, uh, you really need to understand uh, how the, the cohesion in the material develops to start with, starting from its physical chemistry. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to start basically asking the question, why is the material sticky to start with? So if we think about what happens at very small scale, uh, basically what you have is that you have these uh, surfaces of the calcium silicate hydrates that start to precipitate and they are intercalated with water and mainly calcium ions, which is the main ions. So you have negatively charged surfaces uh, and, uh, and ions uh, and water in between. And so if you use the standard, you know, basically you have like charge attraction. 
But uh, usual theories that we have to describe this type of phenomena that capture the phenomena in other systems, they really don't apply to, uh, to this, uh, to cement. So, so if you consider theories like the LBO for uh, uh, the, the range of surface charges that you have in cement and the presence of mainly divalent and multivalent counter ions, uh, basically uh, the LBO would give you just repulsion. So definitely your building would not send. Up. Uh, there, there has been therefore a development uh, and understanding that actually the cohesive forces come from whatever is neglected in this theory, which is the fact that ions in the solution intercalated between the, the calcium silicate hydrate surfaces are actually very um, are actually very correlated. And so there is a, there have been studies of these ion correlation forces showing that indeed, if you keep taking into account, for example, that has been done in simulations of these ion correlation forces, just considering the ions as finite object uh, that can have correlation immersed uh, in, uh, let's say, a bulk dielectric continuum, then you would get uh, attraction. So, but still the attraction that you can predict there, it's actually extremely weak with respect to what you need to make your building stand up. So no way you can use the material in construction, but we use it. So what we have done is actually to uh, consider, in fact, explicitly the role of water. So we have performed a study in which we have a model with uh, the surfaces of calcium silicate hydrate, which are modeled in a simple way, but still with the main characteristics, which is a relatively high surface charge that also, uh, and we consider a range of surface charges because over time, during the reaction that leads to the gelation and the solidification of the material, actually the surface charge density in the calcium silicate hydrates uh, increases. And then we have uh, uh, calcium uh, ions in, the, in, the, in this space. And then we consider uh, basically an explicit description of water with different, uh, with different models. Uh, here I'm picturing uh, SPC uh, type of water. And so what we realize is that, uh, uh, let me show you this plot here. This is the net pressure between the surfaces. And uh, these data here, this field square, they are what you would obtain if you consider the water as a bulk dielectric continuum, but with an explicit description of water, then you finally understand that in fact, the cohesion between the two surfaces actually can be very strong. And not only you can understand that, but you can realize that this uh, incredible, incre uh, this uh, uh, very strong cohesion actually comes from the fact that in confinement, the water is able to reorganize around the ions, building structures that are different from uh, just uh, the bulk hydration shells, but they are uh, uh, incredibly st stable. Basically, what they do is that they deplete the, any bulk like water as uh, the, the confinement between the two surfaces increases, which is dramatically decreases the dielectric screening of water. So uh, basically we have, uh, 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 we capture the behavior of water that has been, uh, and the reduction in the dielectric properties of water in high confinement that has been seen recently in experiments and simulation of fewer confined water. But we can see that in this case, this effect is amplified by the fact that you have ions and the water ion structure actually helps build uh, a, a, a layer in between the two surfaces that becomes uh, extremely stable and, uh, and uh, with very persistent structures. And this is what makes the, the pressure, the cohesive pressure between the two surfaces go up. So this is the comparison of our simulation data with different water models, as I was saying, and with the theory that actually captures these strong correlations between the ions uh, in, uh, in presence of high surface charge densities. And the theory can uh, actually match as well the simulation prediction, not only for the net pressure, but also for the amount of uh, water that is, uh, uh, that is uh, uh, conserved uh, at different uh, degrees of confinement. So the structures, as I said, these are different from uh, the bulk uh, uh, hydration shells. And, uh, and uh, basically because the ions due to the high surface charge density can get squeezed uh, uh, basically uh, to, uh, onto the surfaces. So you get this hemispherical uh, 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 ion water structures. We can compute the free energy of, the, of this type of structure to show that this is what you would get uh, basically this type of uh, uh, structure that uh, change as you increase the confinement uh, is they are there actually to optimize the, the confinement uh, uh, constraints uh, and, uh, and their stability is what basically drives the increase 
of the pressure by two orders of magnitude, uh, which corresponds to the fact that you're basically killing uh, the dielectric screening of water. And, and so you, it's interesting because you get two very distinctive feature of uh, what actually was already known empirically in, uh, in, uh, in the physical chemistry of cement, that is the fact that the forces that actually develop between uh, uh, the cohesive forces that develop during cement hydration, they are very ion specific. And this uh, mechanism that we describe here with the ion water structure is very ion specific because it really depends on how the water is able to reorganize around the ions in very strong confinement. The other important aspect that was already, you know, had already been studied a lot in the cement literature is the fact that as cement hydration proceeds, one can really see that there is the development of two different types, two water population that can be characterized on the basis of the dynamics. And this is, uh, has been done already uh, since 20 years, it had been done, it had been seen in experiments using uh, uh, scattering, uh, NMR, etc., where you could really see that there is a distinction between water that has more, is more uh, free or bulk-like in the dynamics and water that it's extremely, uh, uh, that they call bound water, that it's extremely uh, slowed down and, uh, and confined. And this is exactly what we obtain, and we can uh, compute in this type of simulation scattering functions uh, and compare it directly with experiment. So basically you can see, you can understand where the strong cohesion is coming from. And now you can understand how that depends on the type of ions that are in the, uh, involved uh, in the material uh, uh, production. And uh, what is also interesting that you can see how changing the surface chart, because this mechanism and the type of structure that you form change, it also changes the profile of the interaction. So if we imagine that over time surface chart density is increasing, you can go from interactions basically that have a, uh, a minimum uh, and a competing uh, intermediate range repulsion, and then a progressively deeper uh, uh, attractive well, which is what you obtain for at the end of the hydration. And this is in fact very reminiscent of what had been observed in the very first experiment where they have tried to measure forces between this uh, calcium silicate hydrate using an AFM tip on, on which they had grown uh, calcium silicate hydrate and used to poke it, the hydrating material to measure the nanoscale forces between them. So we have now a key to understand the results of those experiments and we have a key to understand and guide us our study, not only of how the physical chemistry of the initial material affects the cohesion that you get, but also how the effective interactions develop over time. And so now we have some tools to really understand how then the gel forms grows and leads to a material with uh, a specific uh, morphology and mechanics. And so this is the point that I want to make next. So what I'm really interested in is what happens here at this scale where the nanoparticles aggregate and form these structures with this variety of pores in which actually the water is mainly trapped through the mechanism that I was uh, uh, explaining before uh, and uh, remains trapped in this, uh, in this many pores uh, as the material solidifies. And you form these pores which are actually very important for humidity control, uh, uh, insulation, thermal and acoustic insulation and in construction. So this pore structure is actually something that makes cement and concrete uh, very special materials, specially suited for construction. So basically the way we uh, approach this problem is saying, okay, knowing uh, these forces between these nanoparticles, we can actually design a process in which we can study the formation of a gel as these particles are continuously produced, because this is what happens in the real material, that uh, you have some sort of colloidal gel that forms, but the particles are continuously produced by this, uh, uh, by this uh, um, uh, basically this um, uh, aggregation, by this precipitation of the calcium silicate hydrate and this continuous aggregation. So what we have designed is a scheme where we combine a sort of grand canonical Monte Carlo scheme, which accounts for the precipitation of the nanoparticles, where with chemi for chemical potential, we use basically the free energy gain for the production of one of the, these nanoparticles. And uh, we combine this molecular dynamics uh, that allows us to uh, watch the structure form as the nanoparticles are being produced. 
are being produced. And for the forces that, uh, that act in, the, in this uh, molecular dynamics and in the precipitation of the nanoparticles, so that select where the particles are more likely to precipitate, it's actually, we can use forces that have the characteristics that I had just showed you uh, that are also seen in the experiment. So you go from uh, a, an attractive well with a repulsive shoulder at, high, uh, at, higher, uh, at earlier times, to a progressively deeper well at, and only an attractive uh, interactions uh, at later time. So what if you do this type of simulations and you watch the gel that forms, this is what you see. I'm showing you a movie here where we are considering interaction that corresponds to the early stages of the ratio. So where we have this attractive well and this intermediate range repulsive shoulder. And I see, and in the in the movie, you can see mainly just the connection between the particles are precipitating in the simulation box, and you can see just the connections between the particles for clarity. The color indicates the local density, basically, how many neighbors particles have in that range of the simulation, in that area of the simulation box. So I think you've seen, let me show you maybe the movie uh, again. Uh, so I think you've seen that what you have is that this uh, first structure start to form, which are some sort of small fibrils, and this elongated the growth of this structure comes actually from the shape of the interaction potential, then they branch and form a gel very early, and then this gel has uh, some sort of regular pore distribution sizes, a regular pore size, with, and then densifies uh, around the pores more and more. On the right, you see the same type of simulations that now it's done with the, with the interaction that would correspond to later stages now of dehydration, where the surface charge density has increased and the repulsive uh, shoulder in uh, an intermediate range of repulsion between the nanoparticles has basically nearly disappeared. And so you see basically that as a, a precipitation and aggregation goes on, you get more or less the same, uh, the same type of process, but now the structure that you form in the beginning, because the shape of the interaction is different, uh, it's actually, they are actually much uh, bulkier. You have bigger cluster, a, a, a wider distribution of pore sizes, and the gel densifies over larger regions. So we have actually studied systematically how the shape of the interactions tunes uh, the formation of the change in the shape of the interaction tunes the formation of different type of structures. So we have, uh, we, and how this actually, some part of that is related to really to the shape of the interaction. So we've gone back to the equilibrium condition in which this different type of uh, interaction shapes would, would uh, control the aggregation and, uh, uh, and studied uh, how uh, having or not the, uh, the repulsive shoulder would change from this development of these elongated fibers which allow for the system to percolate very early uh, to the case in which you form this uh, rather very bulk and thick um, gel strands, which then leads to much bigger pores. So if we think about the evolution of the interaction over time now, we realize that what is happening uh, in cement is something like that. So you start from with interactions uh, that uh, allow for a, a fast early stage percolation of the material, which allows for some pore size that can be controlled uh, and that, is, uh, uh, and that uh, guarantees uh, some development of mechanical properties, uh, maybe weak, but early, uh, really at early, uh, early stages. And then uh, as the interactions evolve, actually you switch to interactions that favor the local densification of the gels. So that's how precipitation can continuously occur. Even when it becomes very slow, the material has still some thermodynamic driving towards becoming denser and denser, which is in fact something that it's very important for the material to reach the high densities locally that it's required for to become so strong and to uh, keep densifying as in fact it is observed and it is uh, known to be a characteristics of uh, cement hydration. So 
one question that one can ask is okay, but in fact, this is a very idealized situation, and there is all sorts of heterogeneities that uh, that occur in the real material. For example, the TM picture that I show you, image that I show you in the very beginning, uh, you can see that there is a gradient of density that accompanies also gradient of pore size distribution. So, how is this uh, uh, physical picture that I was proposing for the evolution of the interaction? How is this maintained in presence? of such uh, uh, of, of this type of, uh, of, uh, of issues. And so in this type of simulation, it's interesting because you can introduce a gradually different type of heterogeneities, a gradient in density, gradient in the chemical potential, due to the fact that actually the material will start form and dissolve from the surface, precipitate from the surface of the grains because uh, in the power of the powder, because this is where it starts to dissolve. And so you can play with this type of feature in the simulations and you can obtain different type of structures with different type of degrees of density. And, and so it, you see that the physical picture that I was describing is actually confirmed because the early stages interactions that leads to this uh, more branched network with more regular pore size, actually they turned out to be also more resilient to uh, local heterogeneities uh, and uh, uh, chemical heterogeneities that can occur during uh, cement hydration, whereas uh, the later stages interaction are more sensitive to that, but they come into play at uh, later times when the material has already gained some mechanical stability, which is very interesting to understand how the formation of this solid material is so messy, but can still be relatively robust and it works all the time on the construction site. Okay, so why this is a very interesting insight into uh, the microscopic and nanoscale and mesoscale physics that may be happening at the level of the gel formation. It is interesting because uh, I, uh, I, I think once we understand all these things, we start to have very specific and very clear ideas of where you can act at which stages of these processes to actually modify the material process and do some really uh, material design with this type of uh, system that has never been attempted since uh, the invention of this process uh, that basically leads to the development of Portland cement. But in fact, these properties that we have ident that we have characterized, they are directly important for the performance of the material. If you want to print uh, uh, cement structure, cement and concrete, as you want to do now with the new frontiers that is additive manufacturing that allow would allow to save uh, enormous amount of materials and to develop uh, better uh, strategies actually for more resilient and adapted construction to different climate uh, environment. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, you really need to understand how this buildup of the microstructure uh, interplay with the flow and the formation that you're trying to impose as you print and uh, with the solidification that further occur as the material then hardens in the structure that you have printed. And so with the type of simulation that I showed you, basically you can start from the nanoscale forces, you can go into the gel formation, and then if you push the densification of the gel up to the very late stages, you end up uh, with this type of uh, 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 sample, computational sample, this uh, uh, that we have generated in the computer, which uh, here is colored using basically the local density. So you can see that you get uh, uh, your little uh, cube of material that is, uh, is very dense locally, but it's still uh, fairly heterogeneous uh, due to, and uh, it has features this uh, large pores that actually are elongated and quite rough in their surfaces due to the, 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 the non-equilibrium nature of the process uh, that, uh, that leads to this uh, solidification. And on the left uh, here, you can see the whole pore network uh, that of course we can uh, identify in this type of system. And uh, we can use this pore network to actually analyze the interaction of the material with the external environment uh, to changes in temperature, changes in salinity, changes uh, uh, in uh, different composition of the environment in which the material has to survive over many, many years. 
the, uh, here in the middle, I have a, a, a scattering intensity. Uh, the blue line is, is what we measure, what is measured basically on a hardened cement case in experiments. And the dots, the symbols are our data from the scattering intensity that we can compute in this system. Where you see uh, this uh, uh, low wave vector uh, uh, turn of the scattering intensity, that is indeed very similar and characteristics of what you see uh, in uh, in hardened cement paste, and we can understand that the specific signature, this dependence, actually comes from the roughness of the pores and their elongated structure. So we have now uh, information into crucial aspect of the material properties that you want to control if you want to control uh, the durability and the resilience of the material to different. Uh, environmental condition and to the mechanical, to the to the to the load in the material. So, what is uh, um, you can use the same structure to actually extract, uh, compute the nanoindentation modulus as you would measure in nanoindentation experiments that my colleagues have performed. And so you can see that our data do quite well, that our data actually cover lower uh, densities uh, uh, that what is uh, typically measured in the real materials. And this is because uh, in the nanoindentation experiments, actually uh, they are dominated by the toughest part of the material, which we can actually demonstrate by taking this structure and removing the, the, uh, the, the external layer uh, at the surface of the pores that have a slightly lower density. And as we remove layer by layer, we end up with this very dense uh, hard backbone, which is actually slightly under compression by the way we form it, uh, which is uh, basically corresponds to most of the strength that is measured through the non-indentation models. And this type of analysis also tells us uh, that, uh, at least in this uh, version of the uh, cement hydration that we have mimicked, you get this very hard uh, backbone that is under compression, which is covered by layer of materials uh, that are uh, uh, slightly softer, and they start to be under tension as you approach the surface of the pores. So now this tells us also where uh, uh, this gives a suggestion, and this is what we are working on at the moment, on where actually uh, um, plastic processes can originate of the in the material as the material hardens and then subjected to various type of load and deformation. Like for example, when you want to 3D print or when you subject the material to different type of pre-stresses as it's done in the built infrastructure. And uh, how, and so the question now that it's very interesting is how you control these pre-stresses uh, and pre-stresses really at the smaller scale in the microstructure to design a different type of uh, uh, material properties. So I think uh, this is more or less uh, uh, the overall uh, overview of things that I wanted to tell you. And let me conclude rational, uh, summarize uh, basically what I what I uh, showed you. I've, you know, I've, I, I showed you this uh, insight into where the cement cohesion comes from and how actually we have understood that water plays a, a fundamental role in the cohesion of the material. We all say, always say that cement dries, but in fact cement doesn't dry when it solidifies because most of the water actually stays inside and it's used in the material to actually build up uh, this uh, tremendous cohesion. But we have seen that in fact uh, this, uh, this cohesion requires a, at a very high density, tiny amount of water actually to come uh, to be there. And, uh, and, it's, uh, and the forces that develop uh, because of the, they, they are originating by this uh, iron water structuring that we have been able to highlight in the simulation, they are very iron specific. And, uh, uh, and now we have handled actually to understand how we should think in terms of uh, different type of ions uh, and therefore how can we scientifically drive the discovery actually of uh, greener cement materials, uh, which so far have, have worked mainly with uh, trial and error type of strategies and, uh, and they have not been uh, very successful 
so far. Uh, if you know the forces at the nanoscale, then you can put this in a non-equilibrium statistical mechanics framework to try to understand how the gel growth, how its morphology and the mechanical properties develop. And uh, this led us to, understood, to understand actually how the specific time sequence that continuously occur in, uh, in cement hydration, it's actually crucial to generate that specific type of pore size distribution and mechanical properties that are fundamental for the material to function in the way it functions. And uh, you can push this type of studies to actually then uh, understand the behavior of these type of structures that because developed in this uh, non-equilibrium conditions, they are uh, very much uh, rich of pre-stresses and heterogeneities. And if you have these pre-stresses and heterogeneities uh, 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 under control or taken care of or taken into account in your uh, uh, physical picture, then you have some hope to understand the long-term evolution of the material. And so really how you can make the material smarter and more durable. And uh, uh, with this, I thank you again for your attention. Let me just um, thank my collaborators, uh, which is a, a large group of people from very different backgrounds that have been really fun to work with. Thank you, thank you, Manuela. Thank you. I hope uh, you know. Let me clap. Uh, uh, let me give you a real clap on behalf of the virtual clap of, of the whole <laughs> audience. Thank you. Yes, I am sure that there are questions. I see that Giancarlo has the questions. Please, Giancarlo. Yes, uh, Manuela. Manuela, very nice talk. Thank you. It it was um, uh, very 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 instructive. So I'm uh, very much very much interested in the in the first part in which you are describing the nanoscale origin of the forces and uh, um, you were of course showing that at this um, nanoscale confinement the, the the water structure is determining a very strong interactions indeed um, as you were were pointing um, even without ions you can reach these uh, uh, pressures of the eye of the of the order of of as high as as one gigapascal. So, um, the my question is, um, I have a question and a comment basically. So the, the first is is uh, um, how these uh, the time evolution is really depending on the on the uh, on the water structure. Uh, that, that was not extremely clear to me. And then the, the, the comment is uh, uh, when you use different um, uh, models for water, uh, well, mm -hmm. you, you, you show that you don't get much differences uh, among them. But in reality, we know that none of the atomistic models available now is able to reproduce correctly the uh, you know the ionic solutions. In reality, the viscosity are always very wrongly reproduced, and right. and even the, the qualitative sometimes even just the qualitative behavior is is not correct. So um, and that's a huge problem because even if you introduce polarizable models, you don't get a, um, anything better. So um, how this is going to affect your results? Yeah, so this is a very interesting question, and I invite you to uh, read our paper that will soon be out uh, on this, so you can find uh, a lot more details than what I'm giving now. Uh, but uh, uh, the point is that uh, in uh, in this case, uh, the the there is the basically the if we measure the, the electric properties of water, we find very results, uh, results that are very similar to what has been seen in pure water um, data that have been published uh, very recently. Uh, however, here, this is clearly an effect that comes and it's uh, amplified. In fact, uh, the strength, uh, the mechanical, the, the cohesive strength that you get, uh, it's uh, uh, more closer to 10 gigapascal. And uh, uh, the, but the point is that uh, we can really see how uh, what is important here is the restructuring of the water around the ions. And uh, which, as I was saying, this makes uh, the forces very uh, ion specific. Uh, and, uh, and I think that this is the reason why, uh, at least for, uh, of course, there are many details, you're right, that are different between the different water models. Uh, and, uh, and then you can start to ask, okay, what is really uh, the real 
uh, the, the, the thing that it's more reliable uh, because, uh, and also because you know that as you were saying that uh, uh, Basically, none of the water models seem to do a good job. And uh, even when you go to polarizable model, uh, you are not necessarily gaining anything. Uh, uh, we have started to do some comparison with polarizable model, but of course, it's impossible in the type of studies that we have done. Uh, but basically, all the trends that we see would be just amplified by the polarizable models. But the, what is what is important in the end uh, uh, is that uh, uh, the because it's the water ion structuring that is uh, controlling this increase in the cohesion and the behavior of uh, the cohesion uh, as you go down, uh, as you increase the confinement between the surfaces, then uh, that's why I think that uh, uh, the, the details of the water models are important, but uh, they do not change actually, uh, at least the qualitative picture that we see here. Then if you ask, okay, at which surface charge you would really see this specific behavior, this will depend probably on the water model and for certain things, we know how that works. Um, you asked me also how does the evolution over time changes with the, with the water structure and the two things are coupled because what is known in during cement hydration that basically over time due to other chemistry that is happening uh, in the solution, uh, the surface charge of the particles uh, uh, increases. This uh, increases uh, the amount of ions, uh, of counter ions that are, um, that are intercalated between the two surfaces. And this then changes uh, the ion water structuring uh, as you uh, increase uh, the confinement. Uh, you increase the confinement over time because there is, there is uh, nanoparticles not precipitating continuously over time, which increases their volume fraction and then brings their surfaces together. I hope I've answered a little bit to all the questions that you raised. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Very clear. Thank I'm you. happy to discuss more of that. Yes, I, I would like. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela. There is another question from our president, uh, Roberto. Please, Roberto. Uh, I'm very curious, Manuela. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. Um, did you consider the possibility that uh, uh, you could get better performances or materials using uh, something different than water? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's a very interesting, uh, uh, that's a very interesting point. And, uh, um, and uh, it's, uh, yeah, we have thought about uh, and uh, thought about uh, looking into ionic liquids, etc. So one thing that one has to remember, and I find very, very, I found it very interesting actually over the years, is that uh, this is uh, uh, cement, that you, this is cement. So the, the constraints that you have, uh, you have to work with, are, uh, are very strong because uh, you want something that you can use uh, every day on the construction side. And it has to be cheap and it has to be available everywhere. And, uh, uh, and so there are constraints uh, in this direction. So the, the cement industry is of course very conservative and for good reasons, right? Because then uh, you put something into a building and then you want a building to stand up and stay there for several years. People are living in there and so on. So there is a very strong uh, resistance to change and anything uh, in the way cement is done because it just works. Uh, and uh, because of the pressure that there is now because due to the, on the other hand, to the environmental footprint of all this and the fact that uh, the, the growing needs of the built infrastructure cannot need be met without uh, uh, increasing these numbers uh, 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 by enormous amounts. Uh, basically, that's uh, what you need to, that's why you need to break this, uh, uh, this um, sort of framework and start to think uh, a bit out of the box to search solutions in different directions. But um, yeah, I think that's a very, um, that's a very good point. And uh, uh, there is something uh, that has been uh, explored a little bit. What has been more explored has been uh, changing the type of ions uh, in the solution and uh, try to use different type of materials that have, uh, uh, that have a different type of ionic composition uh, so that you don't need to burn calcium carbonate. Uh, to produce uh, the, to start uh, basically the reaction that leads to the binding agent. 
one thing that I want to say very quickly, just because this is, uh, uh, I think it's uh, uh, maybe interesting uh, for uh, in the Italian community, is that, uh, of course, uh, uh, the cement that Romans were using, this was not made with Portland cement, and it was actually using um, uh, um, material that was coming from a place uh, very close to where I was born, which is uh, from the volcanic ashes that are very common uh, in uh, that part of Italy. And, uh, uh, and so those uh, rocks, uh, they have naturally uh, a similar reaction to the hydration of, uh, to the one that leads to hydration of, uh, of water and cement. But those are materials that are already available on earth. And, uh, and so they are completely green and they have done a very good job in staying there, right? If we if we look at so there are people studying actually in detail uh, the the structure of the Roman concrete to understand uh, what is uh, try to understand understand what works so well there. But I think that there is a, a very important uh, possibilities in sort of blending cement with the local soil, uh, which can be locally sourced and can be different in different. Uh, uh, part of the world uh, to actually increase the sustainability of uh, the construction materials. Uh, there is all sorts of interesting uh, direction that this is going uh, um, currently. So I'm happy to discuss more if people are interested. Thank you. Thank you very yes. much. Thank you. Thank you. I think, um, thank you, Manuela, very much uh, also for this uh, very nice uh, uh, perspective in, in applications of cultural heritage. You know, after all, uh, we are living uh, on the, on the shoulders of giants, so we should uh, cherish that. So unfortunately, we have to move on because of the time. Uh, let's, let me thank again uh, Emanuela on behalf of everyone. And uh, uh, let's, go to, you know, let's go from uh, applications to material science to applications uh, uh, to biological systems, I guess, with uh, biological networks, with Andrea G uh, Gamba from uh, Politecnico Torino. Thank you, Akil. I'm, I'm trying to, to share yes, my I can screen. See that. Yes, I hope you can, can see, see and, and you can hear me. Yes. Please go ahead. The floor is yours. You know, you okay, great. Yourself. So uh, I would like also to thank the organizers for the opportunity of presenting our work. And this is about um, uh, molecular sorting in uh, living cells. And so to um, introduce the topic, uh, I will just start by showing a uh, um, picture of uh, a eukaryotic cell. And uh, from some point of view, uh, a cell is simply a small sphere filled with uh, water, sugars, uh, nucleic acids, uh, and proteins, uh, and uh, lipids, uh, and enclosed uh, in uh, a tiny lipid membrane. However, if you put this cell in appropriate uh, conditions, it's capable of amazing things like, for example, here migrating, uh, and uh, mm, in doing that, you see migration is uh, a fundamental vital function of the cell. And uh, to perform this uh, uh, function, the cell has to actually break its uh, original symmetry and to develop and adopt uh, uh, complicated morphology and dynamically changing uh, morphology. And, uh, what is the origin of this uh, symmetry breaking? In, in this video, you see that some uh, mm, fluorescent tag was uh, uh, attached to a specific molecule. And it can be seen that the molecule, it can be seen from the, the brightness uh, um, spots. Uh, uh, you can see that the molecule is actually mm, not uh, uniformly distributed in the cell, but it, it's actually concentrated. It accumulates in certain domains. Uh, in uh, uh, the front of the cell. So the cell in, in the beginning is a sort of uh, uniform uh, uh, symmetric uh, sphere. And now it has developed the head and the tail and the head is uh, um, advancing and the tail is retracting. And what differentiates the head from the tail is actually the differential concentration of certain molecules. And if we were to uh, attach uh, different uh, fluorescent tags to different uh, molecules, we could see that each and every molecule will uh, uh, accumulate in different uh, domains uh, on the cell membrane, perhaps on the front uh, or on the back. And by doing that, uh, it would uh, mm, provide those domains with a specific uh, uh, 
chemical identity. And this chemical identity is uh, um, actually um, endowing the domain uh, with uh, the ability to perform uh, specific tasks, uh, like, for instance, uh, advancing or retracting or other. And uh, if you go into, into more detail, uh, what you uh, discover is that uh, this process uh, of um, formation of uh, a molecular identity is actually very close to uh, classical phase separation. And for instance, it goes through uh, steps uh, of uh, nucleation of small germs, uh, perhaps by uh, random uh, uh, fluctuations and then uh, competitive growth of domains uh, that uh, since the domains compete for a finite pool uh, of molecules uh, and possibly relaxation to some uh, steady state and we can see this uh, here in uh, um, experimental images of yeast cell where some uh, domains uh, enriched domains uh, are forming uh, initially as uh, uh, small spots, uh, small bright spots, uh, and then uh, they grow and they compete uh, for the finite molecular pool. And uh, in the end, uh, you uh, are left uh, with uh, a single spot uh, surviving, a single domain surviving. This can also be seen here in uh, um, real time. And this is, uh, of course, a very fascinating uh, process. Uh, and uh, actually, this is not all of the story. Because if we look more in depth in the structure of the cell, we discover that its apparent symmetry is actually broken at many levels. The cell is actually subdivided in many compartments bounded by membranes, by lipid membranes. And each of these compartments is actually performing a very specific task. So you, you have the Golgi and endoplasmic reticulum and lysosomes, endosomes, and any kind of small uh, body and uh, all of them uh, performing specific tasks uh, thanks uh, to a specific uh, molecular identity. So the big question is how this molecular identity is uh, generated in the first place, uh, how is it uh, maintained? And actually this is a dynamic picture because uh, uh, membranes, uh, lipid membranes uh, and proteins uh, are continuously exchanged between the different compartments and this is apparently just uh, complicating the picture and it turns out that there is a, a specialized process uh, which is called molecular sorting which consists uh, in uh, concentrating specific molecules into small lipid vesicles that are then transported and delivered to the right destination in such a way to keep the right order, the right organization in, in the inner parts of the cell. And in this cartoon, this is shown as three proteins of different colors, red, green, and yellow. And these proteins are separated and they are destined to different phases. They are separated and vesicles are formed that are enriched in only for instance, the yellow protein or the red protein or the, or the green protein, and these vesicles are delivered to different destinations. So you have this process that is molecular sorting. It concentrates molecules in small vesicles. The vesicles are delivered to the right destinations, and this way the, the, the order is maintained in the system. And of course, I think a natural question arises. So how these uh, enriched vesicles are generated in the first place. This is a, a main question of molecular biology and the answer provided by molecular biology is uh, molecular. So what you find in the literature is that there are hundreds of molecules in, of, of proteins involved uh, into, this protein, uh, in, into this process and each protein is actually taking care of some step of the process. And if you delete or inactivate some of these proteins, you have misregulation of the process and then you can have severe diseases and so on and so forth. However, we, we, we would like to find some description of, of the process that is more synthetic, that would uh, uh, more physical, that would uh, take into account only the main, some uh, ingredient that you cannot really do without. And uh, what uh, are these ingredients? So one of these ingredients is actually already under our eyes since uh, the step 
of uh, concentration of uh, um, molecules, uh, well, we know that uh, on lipid membranes, uh, all of the time you have this free separation process that uh, leads to the formation of enriched domains. So this is uh, one uh, mechanism that is already available. You have uh, some uh, intermolecular interactions. I am not going into the details and these intermolecular interprotein interactions. So here you have a schematic uh, depiction of a lipid membrane with proteins on it and the interprotein interactions are going to favor the formation of certain uh, enriched domains on the lipid membrane. Now imagine for a moment uh, that the formation of this domain in itself, that this, the dynamics of this domain is going to interact with the dynamics of the membrane in such a way to bend the membrane and to start the formation of a small vesicle. And this small vesicle is going to invaginate and then possibly to be detached from the membrane and it will engulf by this process the proteins that were contained in the domain. And since the domain was already enriched in these proteins, the um, uh, vesicle itself will be enriched in the same protein. So in, in some sense, you have a very simple uh, basic uh, mechanism, a very basic distiller uh, that has the potential to actually introduce order in the cell by dividing different molecular species and packing them into small vesicles that then can be transported to different destinations. So th th this, this would be um, a, a nice, a simple uh, description of the process. And of course, it all rests uh, on the hypothesis that actually the dynamics uh, of the domains and of the membranes are actually coupled. And uh, again, I will not go into details, but evidence is actually emerging in uh, re very recent years that this is actually so. Here are, for instance, two very recent papers uh, which are actually stating uh, that uh, uh, the formation of uh, um, enriched domains by phase separation is actually driving the nucleation of vesicles. So uh, starting from these considerations, uh, we uh, proposed that we formulated a minimalistic model of molecular sorting. And in this model, we have simply the lipid membrane, and then we have uh, mm, proteins, uh, uh, molecules uh, being uh, inserted in the, the membrane by some random process and these uh, molecules then uh, um, there will be some flux of these uh, of these molecules uh, into into the system and the molecules are going to diffuse around uh, on the membrane and uh, there will be some uh, attractive interaction and due to this attractive interaction the molecules are going to form uh, uh, domains and these domains uh, will grow and when they reach a certain characteristic size let's say the size of a vesicle they are extracted by some processes so they are extracted from the system so you have insertion of molecules by a random process and extraction of uh, uh, a distillate of these molecules so uh, vesicles uh, enriched in the in the given in the given molecule and, and so this would be the a minimalistic view of a simple uh, lipid membrane distiller. And uh, the, the question here is uh, how efficient is it? So you have these molecules, they come into the membrane, they, they wander around uh, looking for sorting domains, the domains growth and are extracted. And how much time do these molecules spend on, on the membrane? So you have a, a uh, natural uh, quantity to consider here, which is the average time that the molecule spends uh, on the membrane. And you may imagine that if this time is short, then the process uh, of uh, sorting uh, would be efficient. And if this time is long, it would not be efficient. And you can also speculate that perhaps uh, since this uh, molecular sorting is linked to many fundamental responses of the cell to its environment, perhaps having a fast uh, sorting uh, may be evolutionarily uh, advantageous for, for the cell. So can we actually compute uh, this uh, uh, residence time for this kind of system that we may 
for simplicity study in the stationary state. So we have some molecules coming in and some molecules coming out and in average the influx and our uh, outgoing flux are the same. So um, the, 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 the general picture is that you have this two dimensional system with the uh, domains that grow due to the absorption of molecules from a two dimensional surrounding gas of three molecules. And if you focus on a single uh, domain, a single circular domain, everything is very simple and you can write down everything exactly like the concentration profile of the molecule gas in, in the surrounding. And uh, uh, by taking a, a gradient of this profile, you may compute the flux of molecules towards the domain. And this flux of molecules is actually a function of, of the jump in concentration between the regions that are far from the domain and the region that are uh, close to the domain where you have depletion of molecules due to absorption. And this is a parameter which uh, uh, we don't know uh, yet, but we are going to find it uh, uh, self consistently. And then uh, from, uh, um, from this uh, uh, flux, uh, you can easily derive the law of uh, accretion of the domains. And uh, now you can imagine having many of these domains uh, and they are exchanging uh, molecules uh, with the surrounding gas. And you can describe this situation by introducing the number density of the domains. So uh, this NRT would be the number of domains uh, of given uh, size uh, R. And uh, um, this number density is going to uh, evolve in time. It will, it will evolve according to some uh, Smoluchowski equation and where you insert uh, some term for the extraction of the domains uh, when they reach uh, the characteristic uh, extraction size. And uh, you want to study this system in the stationary state uh, and in the stationary state, you can actually solve uh, this Smoluchowski equation and you find an explicit expression for the distribution of the domains over sizes. And, uh, and then uh, since you are in the stationary state and the flux of molecules that are coming in and the, flux of, and the molecules that are coming out uh, must be in average uh, the same, then you impose this condition and you find a normalization of this uh, uh, number distribution and then you are able to actually compute uh, the, uh, the number of uh, domains per unit area in terms uh, of the control parameters uh, of the system. Um, now that you have done uh, all of this, uh, you are in a position to actually compute the residence time of the molecules. The residence time of the molecules uh, is, uh, can be split into two contributions. So you have a contribution which is the time that the molecules spend freely diffusing on the membrane and uh, uh, looking for some sorting domains and the time that they spend uh, in average uh, in the domains uh, which are growing, uh, waiting to be extracted. So the time that the, the molecules spend uh, freely diffusing uh, can be estimated from uh, uh, the area they have to wonder about uh, and ultimately is a, a function of the number of domains. Maria, sorry, you have three more minutes. Yeah, that we have computed. Yeah. And uh, the, the, um, the time that they spend in the domain that can be uh, computed by um, the law of growth of the domains. So, uh, and lastly, you, you have nucleation of domains, and this is a quadratic process in, uh, in the gas density. And putting all together, what you find are nice uh, um, uh, scaling laws for the gas density is a function of the flux of incoming molecules and the interaction strength. Um, the, uh, the, the intermolecular interaction strength. And from these, uh, you find uh, that uh, the, the time that the molecules spend uh, freely diffusing, this is uh, um, a decreasing function of the interaction strength, uh, how, while the time that they, they spend in the domains is an increasing function. And since the residence time is actually a, a sum of these two contributions, you find a minimum. So you find that there is an optimal interaction strength where the process is most efficient. And uh, uh, so you may, uh, and in, in, in this regime, you find also that the, the, the density of the molecules in the system is minimal and the number 
of the main cis minimal, which is sort of uh, paradoxical because we may naively expect that actually the more domain, the more sorting domains, uh, the, the more efficient the process, and it's actually the other way around. So you can confirm these uh, um, predictions uh, by introducing a, a simple lattice gas model. And in this simple lattice gas model, you can actually see very well the existence uh, of a um, optimal uh, regime where the, the process of sorting is most efficient. And you can actually see from these snapshots uh, the reason for the existence of this uh, optimal regime. Uh, when the interaction strength is very high, uh, it becomes very easy to uh, nucleate new domains. And you have a proliferation of domains that all compete for the uh, fixed uh, incoming flux of molecules. So each domain grows uh, very slowly. And uh, um, you can also check the um, scaling laws with good accuracy. And you find uh, a simple uh, um, phase diagram here uh, where um, you have on the horizontal axis the interaction strength, on the vertical axis the incoming flux, and you have this line of optimal sorting. And it's of course interesting to check whether this uh, uh, framework can uh, interpret, uh, can be useful to interpret actual experiments. And actually, actual experiments can be easily be done by um, again attaching fluorescent tags uh, to the molecules that are being sorted, and then you can automatically uh, identify and track uh, these uh, uh, spots, these growing domains, uh, and then you can uh, derive an experimental histogram of uh, uh, the size of these domains. Uh, and uh, it turns out that uh, this can be uh, uh, fitted very well uh, with, uh, the theoretical, uh, with the theoretical curve uh, uh, once you fit uh, a couple of uh, um, parameters. And you can also derive from the real time data, you can also derive some information about the flux and density of the sorted molecules. And here the precision is not very high, but you can find upper and lower bounds for, uh, for the flux and density. Uh, of the molecules, uh, and apparently, uh, and this is this would be the dashed area here in uh, which uh, has been mapped on the phase diagram, and uh, apparently this is uh, at least in order of magnitude compared com compatible with the hypothesis that uh, real cells are actually working close to this uh, optimal regime. So this will be summing up. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have proposed a physical model of molecular sorting, which is based on two very simple ingredients, so phase separation of cell membranes and uh, domain-induced vesicle nucleation. This is uh, uh, solvable under simplified assumptions, and you can find simple, simple scaling laws. And the most important thing is you find an optimal regime. Sorting is most efficient for intermediate values of interaction strength, where the number of sorting centers is uh, minimal and apparently this is compatible with uh, um, experimental data and uh, in the future uh, of course you are going to uh, try to extend this kind of investigation uh, looking at what happens if you can if you for instance sort many molecular species in parallel since uh, uh, well uh, this process uh, can uh, be performed for many molecular species in parallel and probably hundreds of molecular species. So uh, this, this opens up the uh, idea that the cell is actually a, a, a big molecular distiller, which is uh, dis distillating all of the time, many, 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 many molecular species. And then you can hope uh, to have uh, advancement, uh, experimental advancements, since you may um, hope to uh, tune the molecular interaction strength with different means like light, gene editing, and drugs. And finally, it has to be noted that many uh, severe diseases are actually linked to uh, misregulation of molecular sorting. So understanding the basics of the process may have in the future some uh, um, actual consequences. So thank you very much for listening. I thank hope you, Andrea. Thank it was you. It's not too late. Uh, well, it's a bit too late. Sorry. Okay. Right, a bit late. Uh, yeah. So uh, thank you. And also you know, giving you a clap on behalf of the whole audience. 
So, uh, so uh, given the time uh, and given the fact that we want to keep uh, the schedule uh, uh, that, that, that was uh, originally planned, and uh, I suggested that you know, that, that, you know Andrea, will, of course, will be around uh, for questions. Yes, so for sure. We, so we can close the section here, and then uh, um, you know, uh, please be back. Uh, you know, go get the coffee, but be back exactly at, at three fifty. And for those of you who are interested in discussing with uh, with Andrea, uh, this uh, you know, you may stick around. So thank you to both of you and uh, and, and see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Grazie, Kille. Ciao, ciao. Yes. Andrea? Sì. sì. Posso farti una domanda velocissima? Sì. Perché una cosa interessante secondo me, cioè come fai su una sfera a definire la, la questione? Perché tu prendi appunto quando tu hai un cluster, un cluster è definito per poterlo eliminare in qualche modo, no? Cioè mm -hmm. il modello devi definire una distanza, no? Quindi un, un algoritmo sì. di clustering, un algoritmo di clustering sulla sfera. È basato... sì. cioè... Quindi va bene, noi come mh, per semplicità in effetti abbiamo usato una, una cellula o endosoma quadrato <ride> con condizioni al contorno periodiche e, mh, sì, e ma, abbiamo ma, estratto ma, cluster... Ma, 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 ma cellula e cluster è, è sempre sulla sfera però. Sì, ok, d'accordo, però le simulazioni le abbiamo condotte su un quadrato per semplicità, ma si sì, sarebbero potute fare su una sfera ah, naturalmente. Okay. Eh. E, e abbiamo estratto eh, i cluster connessi che superavano una taglia fissata. Quindi questo qua era il protocollo. Sì, avevo, avevo, avevo dubbi appunto perché in realtà si potrebbe fare con la geometria differenziale, eccetera, però insomma è, è, è tutto più complicato perché ovviamente dipende dal raggio di curvatura. Sì, eh, infatti la questione, le questioni collegate all'influenza della curvatura sono senz'altro interessanti. Allora noi siamo partiti proprio dal modello più, più semplice possibile e quindi abbiamo ignorato questo. Ah, te lo dico Però perché sarebbe interessante guardare perché verosimilmente la curvatura può favorire la nucleazione delle vesicole. Esatto, Adesso, te lo dico quindi... Non è a caso perché c'è un lavoro recente su soft matter di, del gruppo di Durham, c'è cioè Mark Miller, eccetera, che loro fanno queste simulazioni, diciamo, su un toro, mm -hmm. che quindi ha, eh, ha una curvatura esterna e una interna, no? e, 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 e hanno questa specie di, di, di transizione di fase in funzione della, del raggio di curvatura. Che... E loro cosa, che cosa guardano? Eh, guardano esattamente, c'è cioè un processo di nucleazione, anche lì è proprio una specie di, di transizione gas-liquido, però su, un toro, su, un, su una superficie toroidale. Quindi su un... Ed è, della, è di quest'anno, mi pare che sia di quest'anno, comunque è un soft matter, eh, o quest'anno, l'anno scorso, o fine dell'anno scorso, e uno dei autori è sicuramente Mark Miller di Durham eh, non, non l'ho visto ma, 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 ma lo cerco, grazie e, um... perché lì, lì proprio è, è tutto la, la driving force di questa cosa qui è proprio è tutta sulla, sulla curvatura cioè quindi sull'effetto della curvatura nella, nel, nel clustering sì, ma questo è molto interessante infatti in prospettiva perché per esempio c'è, non so, l'operato del Golgi che ha tantissime regioni di alta curvatura e svolge proprio questa funzione di, di distillazione. E in più tu potresti avere situazioni in cui se in una certa regione ha una curvatura più alta e quindi la nucleazione delle vescicole è favorita, 
e mh, quello sarebbe un, una specie di pozzo per, mm. per il tuo gas di molecole, quindi avresti dei flussi, cioè ci sono un, una serie di cose che infatti sono d'accordo, sono molto, molto interessanti, okay. non le abbiamo guardate inizialmente, che okay. no, no, so, so, il problema cosa, cosa possiamo fare con, con il modello più di base possibile. Certo, certo. Ok, ve lo sono segnato. Ah, Mario, che è molto interessante. C'è Mario che vuole farti una domanda, credo. Sì, cioè, esatto, ciao Andrea. Più una domanda è una, così, un commento insieme. Perché, eh, Oi, ciao. Una delle cose che tra l'altro io trovo interessanti nella visione delle transizioni di fase nel sistema biologico, come ti ho raccontato, il fatto che alla fine sono dei meccanismi a soglia, quindi sono interessanti dal, anche dal punto di vista della regolazione del sistema, perché tu non devi fare un fine tuning Mm -hmm. dei componenti molecolari, molecolari, ma puoi avere una risposta, come dire, appunto on-off, magari di regolazione, eh, senza appunto bisogno di, di fine tuning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Esatto, esatto, sì, sì, sì. Perché come nei vostri modelli, nel senso, esatto. puoi pensare... Perché qui è come se tu avessi un, una specie di, di raggio critico. Ma il fatto stesso che assembli strutture sopra una certa soglia di concentrazione di molecole, esatto. così, mm -hmm. eh, come dire, se tu sei sotto quella soglia non, non, non succede niente, il sistema si comporta in uno stato macroscopico, esatto. se supera la soglia complessivamente switch. E... So, sono d'accordo, infatti questo è molto bello, cioè sem sembrerebbe essere appunto un... un, un... Una di quelle caratteristiche che tutti aspetteresti al sistema biologico è che possa passare da un regime, magari a un altro regime, perché c'è certo. una regola verso l'alto, la concentrazione di, di qualcosa. E, sì, c'è qualcosa in mente, ma mi è sfuggito, ma... Mh, Assolutamente, comunque sono, sono d'accordo, questo, questo discorso del, del, dei meccanismi. Perché, per esempio, ecco, no, quello che volevo dire è che mh, adesso noi diamo questa descrizione super semplice, però chiaramente in questi domini, questi domini sono eterogenei, tu hai tante specie molecolari assieme. Tipicamente queste specie molecolari cooperano, cioè tipo la specie A che mh, forma dei legami o ha delle interazioni con la specie B, e magari la specie B è presente pure in concentrazioni piccole ma ha un ruolo fondamentale se tu cambi la concentrazione della specie B passi da una situazione in cui si formano in cui hai, hai separazione di fasi ma in cui non ce l'hai per esempio e, è molto interessante bene, è stato comunque bello rivederti dopo un po' eh sì, infatti a dopo dai, ciao ciao
Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the last part of today's meeting. Uh, I am Francesca Golaiari, and uh, it's a, a real pleasure for me to be here today to chair the next session. In this session, we will have three talks, uh, all three of them related to a very active field of research in statistical physics, which uh, deals with complex networks and how their topology affects the dynamical processes uh, taking place onto them. Uh, for those of you uh, just join us, let me remind you that the, this meeting is being recorded, so please turn off your camera if you do not wish your face to appear on the video recording. You are welcome to ask questions to our speakers at uh, the end of each talk. And also feel free to type your questions into the chat and I will bring them up at the end of the presentation if time permits. And in this way, you will uh, also give the speakers a chance to answer uh, in case we are short of time. Okay, for the speakers of this session, let me remind you that each of you will have a total of 20 minutes, uh, including question. And now let me uh, welcome our uh, first speaker, uh, Dr. Anna Paola Montoni from the Italian Institute uh, for Genomic Medicine uh, of uh, Politecnico di Torino. Uh, it's, the, these are two separated things, let's say. So I'm a postdoc in the, the Italian oh, sorry. of Genomic Medicine and I work and on Politecnico di Torino. It's okay. And uh, sorry about that. It's fine. Uh, Anna Paola's talk uh, will be about an extremely topical and uh, much debated subject uh, today, which is uh, uh, how to use contact tracing and statistical inference as uh, a control uh, strategy for uh, epidemic mitigation. Okay, Anna Paola, you can share your screen now. Okay. And you have the floor. You have the floor. Okay, uh, can you see my presentation? Yeah. So, okay, my name is Anna Paola Montoni, as uh, Francesca uh, told before, I'm a postdoc at the Italian Institute for Genomic Medicine. I also work in Politecnico di Torino. And the work that I'm going to present today is, um, let's say, made last year together with a lot of co-authors, as you can see. Uh, a lot of them work in the Politecnico di Torino, some other works at uh, ENS in Paris, some other at EPFL in Switzerland or ICTP in uh, Trieste. Uh, so the, the work is aimed at, uh, let's say, use some uh, tools uh, provided by statistical mechanics to, to try to control the COVID-19 pandemics. So uh, I really, don't have to, uh, sorry, I, this is better. So uh, I don't have, I don't need to like present to you, introduce to you the, pro to you the problem, I, su I suppose, because I all know what the COVID-19 disease is now. And uh, I just want to stress a few things about this pandemic. So, so the first thing is that the virus uh, can spread uh, using both symptomatics and asymptomatic individual, and that's why this is very hard to mitigate because asymptomatic individual doesn't show, uh, say, syndromes, but are able to infect other other individuals. That's why it's hard to mitigate it. And uh, well, at least last year, the most effective strategy that uh, was able to um, at least control a little bit the epidemic spreading was to use contact tracing. So, so that I mean, the, the past, the recent uh, contacts. Uh, are traced and then test and in case isolate uh, to stop the say the, the disease the spreading of the disease so the first let's say naive uh, ma uh, contact trace is then manual contact tracing so suppose for instance uh, that this uh, very small network of, of uh, more or less 18 individuals so for each time step uh, I have that few of them meet so I have a contact between the nodes of this small nectar I and J up to a certain time, let's say T, uh, big T. And uh, when, whenever an infected individual is detected, well, uh, this person has the, the say, uh, has to declare to the health authority, which are the recent contacts, maybe with uh, the relatives or the friends or co-worker and so on and so forth. And these people uh, need to be tested against uh, COVID-19. Uh, but um, okay, there is a problem on this approach. For instance, you don't know 
every contact that has been with uh, recently. So for instance, if you use, you go to a restaurant or you use public transportation, you cannot, let's say, uh, be aware of all the people you meet. So uh, one idea was to try to use digital contact tracing. So everyone has a smartphone, so can download, uh, let's say, an app for the uh, contact tracing. And this app uses the Bluetooth to record all the contacts to individuals that has installed the app. So suppose that now we have all the, uh, let's say, all the temporal contacts of this small network, and we observe that two nodes of these small, con this, of these small networks are infected, well, the, the, the server can, uh, let's say, check the, the recent contacts and give a notification to these individuals, and these ones have the right to be uh, tested against virus. So uh, I mean, a mixture of these two strategies uh, seems to be very effective in some region of the world. For instance, in the UK, where the NHIS COVID app was re-downloaded. Uh, but however, this, strat this uh, strategies has some uh, drawbacks. So for instance, uh, the notifications say to you that you were in contact with someone that has been uh, com, uh, tested positive to COVID-19, but doesn't quantify how lucky you are, let's say, uh, infected. You don't give you like a score or how likely you, you, you can be infected. And as you can imagine, as the epidemic spreads, then the number of notification and uh, so the number of people that needs to be tested can increase dramatically. And so, uh, but maybe this number is much, much larger than the fraction of population which is actually positive to to COVID-19. So uh, this leads to a misuse of medical resources, which means human resources and also COVID-19 swaps. So our idea uh, was the following. I mean, can we uh, use the, the data collected by digital contact tracing and together with the assumption of some kind of propagation model for uh, COVID-19 help in first reconstruct the epidemic trajectories, and secondly, to give uh, an assessment of uh, the individual risk of these uh, uh, the old individuals uh, that have downloaded the app. And so, okay, let's uh, do, let's um, let's go into the details of this uh, uh, of this modeling. Uh, let's call that uh, the, um, let's say that, um, let's define let's say the collective trajectory of these n individuals as x of t, where t is a time, a discrete time. So um, at the moment, I, I mean, for this talk, I'll use discrete time, but, but this uh, framework could be generalized also to continuous time. And uh, uh, I mean, the states uh, that a, a, each xi of t can take will be clear in the following. But for instance, for at the moment, let's consider this trajectory x uh, of t and plus a set uh, of the observations. So the results of medical tests, so both the uh, positive and the negative results of the test. I want to stress this. Uh, we collect all this information together with the contacts and uh, we ask ourselves, what is the probability of the collective trajectory t at, x at, at each time step t given a set of the observations. And from bias theorem, which is, uh, this is called the a posteriori probability, which is nothing else than, but the product of the likelihood of the, of the observation. So uh, let's say the probability of the observation given uh, the trajectory normalized by the evidence, which is, uh, let's say, independent of the trajectory. Where therefore, we are trying to, we are going to neglect this in the following. And uh, most important thing is the prior probability of the trajectory, which uh, defines our uh, more epidemic model. And uh, I will be uh, more precise in a second. So uh, our uh, the epidemic model that uh, we, are we deal with is uh, the SIR model. It's a compartmental model in the sense that all the population is uh, subdivided in, in, two, in three types of, uh, of states. So it can mean three types of states. So the susceptible, the infected, and the recovered state. And the process is ir irreversible, meaning that uh, at the beginning of the epidemics, all the individuals belong to the S state, except for the patient zero, so the first infected nodes. Then uh, every uh, time you have a contact, a time T, and uh, a node I is infected, can spread the disease to a susceptible node with a probability which is lambda, and it is uh, at the moment constant. Uh, then uh, each node can um, can recover, so you can go from state I to state uh, R with a probability which is called mu. 
And uh, uh, of course, this is, let's say, uh, the probability that a node uh, can get in, an infection at time t. This is the expression where lambda ij is equal to lambda if there is a contact at time t or zero otherwise. Uh, what this kind of um, partially works for COVID-19 in the sense that you, we think that uh, um, when you get, let's say, recovered, uh, you get also immunization from the disease. So you, you, there is a, let's say, the, the, the time at which you get susceptible again is much more larger in the scale of the uh, dynamics that we are studying. Uh, but uh, however, it doesn't catch all the details. So what we have done is to consider um, more, let's say, detailed model about the, uh, the propagation, which is called OpenABM. Uh, and it's been published, uh, published uh, last year. So this uh, model is, again, an uh, uh, irreversible uh, model. And uh, instead of three states, it has uh, 11 states. So it's very specific. And uh, uh, let's say the rate at which you get a transition between each of the states or the characteristic time tau uh, depends uh, on the age of the individuals. So it's very specific. And all these rates are also time dependent in the sense that uh, these uh, probabilities depend on the time elapsed since infection. And uh, so uh, how can we improve our S very simple SIR model to, uh, let's say, catch some of the details of this more complicated model. So our, um, our idea was to first map uh, every, uh, every one of the uh, 11 states into one of the three possible states of the SIR. So the color here says to you the, the mapping. And uh, plus, uh, we have modified the probability of infection, the probability of recover, uh, fitting basically the uh, probability of infection and the probability of recovering of this uh, complicated model. And uh, it ends up that uh, the probability uh, of uh, infection uh, at time delta t, which is the time elapsed since infection, is distributed according to a gamma, fun a gamma distribution of average of six days and the standard deviation 2.6 days. Instead, the mm, okay, recovery delay, so the time at which you recover after the infection is distributed according to a gamma function, gamma distribution, sorry, of 16 days and the standard deviation of 5.6 days. Um, okay, so now our priors is the following. So it's the, the probability of all the trajectories, uh, trajectories at any time is the probability that so the initial condition that takes into account of the number of patient zero times, uh, let's say, this transition probability, which, which is non-Markovian, because, I mean, the, prob the infection probability and the recovery probability that we have just seen uh, depends on time. And the memory term is more or less three or three weeks because of the terms that I'm, I'm showing you before. Uh, instead, the likelihood is uh, factorized uh, with respect to the observation. Uh, and uh, uh, where if we introduce this probability PFNR of PFPR, we can easily model also the noise affecting the medical test. So the, um, the false negative rate of the medical test and the false positive rate of the medical test. But uh, anyway, this is not sufficient in the sense that if we plug all these uh, ingredients in the posterior probability that I've shown you before, still the problem is intractable. And what we have done, uh, seen the, the work that I'm going uh, to present is uh, uh, to apply to uh, methods borrowed from statistical mechanics, which is simple mean field and belief propagation to approximate the unknown posterior and give, let's say, an estimate of the risk of each individual. Uh, I'm not going to talk about simple mean field because I uh, don't have uh, sufficient time. I'm, I'm I will focus on only belief propagation because it's, le it's uh, let's say, more accurate than simple mean field since, uh, let's say, our description on using belief propagation is fully, is fully Bayesian. And first, we can use this non-Markovian and more precise SIR model. So I'm going to the details of this belief propagation approximation. Let's say that in order to use this scheme, we need to introduce some uh, uh, auxiliary variables. And uh, in, the, in our case, where this, the collection of the infection time and the recovery time called Z and R. So you, you can, uh, it's easy to see that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, a full trajectory and this set of uh, um, 
of, uh, of variables. So whenever this infection time, the recovery times are, are determined, then the trajectory of every individual is defined, for instance, in this uh, very simple example. But together with this, we also need, need our, let's say, redundant set of variables, which are called the S variable, which are, let's say, the infection time, but associated with each edge of our, um, of our graph. And um, it is, the, let's say, uh, this variable is associated with each i and j in contact at time t. And uh, it is the time at which i, sorry, it's, it's, it gives you a time. So it's time at which i, if it is fact, uh, it can infect, let's say, the, um, the neighbor has, uh, the neighbor j, which is in the state s. And this is the conditional probability of this uh, uh, variable sij given the infection time of the infector i and the recovery time of the infector i. So the first term deals with an actual infection in, at time sij. So this is the probability of get, getting an infection at the time sij, which is given by also the product that you don't have an infection before. Instead, this last term deals with the fact that I does not infect J, so this, let's say, this time goes to infinity in, in our model. Um, as you can see, these lambda uh, are the one uh, that comes from the uh, fitting of the open ABM model. And uh, similarly, we can uh, put a prior over the recovery delay, and uh, uh, this is the prior of this delta time, and it is distributed according, the, according to the gamma distribution fitted from a, a open ABM model. So uh, this is our target a posteriori probability now, we, uh, defined over this set of auxiliary uh, variables, and uh, we can, uh, let's say, uh, smartly um, apply the belief propagation approximation on the associated factor graph. Uh, I don't have the time to give you all the details of the, uh, let's say, iteration, but uh, let's say the belief propagation approximation is uh, performed like uh, iter iter iterating uh, some fixed point equation uh, associated with uh, the belief propagation messages. And at convergence, what we can compute are the belief propagation, the beliefs, which, are, which is basically an estimate of the probability that uh, a node have a certain state. Uh, here, for instance, we are interested in the probability that uh, a certain individual i uh, gets infected at time zi. So um, to, to estimate the risk, we are plenty of choice. For instance, we can uh, concentrate ourselves on the marginals of each individual at a certain the time, the same which we want to, to do the, the inference. Or uh, we have seen that empirically this uh, uh, formula works very well. So we sum basically all the probabilities that a node can get an infection from, let's say, today, so the time of the intervention, and uh, uh, let's say tau days ago. Uh, so tau here in practice is of the order of the of the of a week. Um, our our scheme so is the following. Uh, we uh, we use uh, an app for the you know, let's say an app for the contact tracing. So we collect all the contacts during time and also the observations. So both uh, you know, tested and, and post tested positive and tested negative individuals. Then at a certain time that I call uh, the time of intervention, we do the reconstruction step, which means that we try to infer all the co collective trajectory for all the times from time, say one, when you have to solve the patient zero problem in up to the time of the intervention. And once you have all the belief propagation, the beliefs of the belief propagation approximation, you can compute the risk estimate and the node with the highest risk can be tested. Then the positive one are, uh, let's say, confined, put in, uh, in quarantine, instead the, the tested negative are free to go. And we collect all the observation for the next, uh, iterations. Well, what we have done is to, uh, let's say, try this scheme on uh, realistic but still synthetic epidemic outbreaks, uh, performing some simulation using uh, as forward model, an open ABM model, and instead we use this non-Markovian SIR to uh, perform the reconstruction steps. Uh, well, I just want to mention that the contact network is provided by the open ABM model itself, and it is a, a superposition of a households, a workplace, and random networks. So the households are fully connected uh, networks. The workplace are instead small work, 
uh, uh, small world networks where each day you pick uh, only a certain fraction of the possible ages and uh, random networks connect, uh, let's say, uh, all the, the nodes randomly of the let's say, entire household networks and the workplace networks. So um, uh, now one more minute. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, this is our scheme. So we let the epidemics evolve up, up to uh, 10 days and we simulate an epidemics when you start uh, using 50 in a patient zero. When we perform the, reconstru the, the, uh, the reconstruction and the testing and quarantine step uh, on a daily base basis. And is it to, let's say, to simulate a realistic scenario, we uh, automatically confine the severe symptomatic individuals. So people that uh, show symptoms um, stay at home. Uh, as you can see, so um, we are comparing simple mean feed and belief propagation uh, to uh, against random guessing. So we pick random some nodes and we observe them and we put in quarantine. They are uh, tested positive and against the contact tracing where uh, you basically send notification and then test all the contacts in the past five days. Uh, as you can see, basically, so this is the number of the infected individuals against the number of uh, days. Uh, when you change the number of observation, and for observation meaning the medical test. As you can see, the BP uh, belief propagation strategy is basically the one that is most effective uh, in controlling the epidemics, and it, it is able using uh, a very um, say minor, fraction, uh, minor number of uh, medical tests to stop completely the epidemics. Uh, well, but this is, let's say, the ideal case in which the medical tests are exact and the, the upper doctor fraction is of 100%, meaning that we know exactly the temporal contact network, but this is not really realistic. So what we have done is to change a little bit these, uh, uh, these settings. So first of all, we, uh, let's say, use inaccurate medical tests and we change the false negative rate uh, from 0 0.09 to 0 0.40. And you can see that even if the 30% of the tests are basically inaccurate, when the leaf propagation is still able to stop completely the epidemics. In the other case, we have an adoption fraction of the app, which is not 100%. And well, you can see that all the models are not able anymore to stop the, the, the pandemics, but still the number of infected people is very reduced. It means that you are, let's say, gain time to, uh, let's say, think about other measures such as lockdowns, for instance. Uh, okay, so I have finished. Uh, we have seen how to use, let's say, some methods borrowed from statistical mechanics to try to reconstruct the epidemic trajectory and also to quantify individual risk to be infected. Uh, well, this strategy seems to be very effective in synthetic outbreaks. And uh, well, this is our some future development. Um, First of all, well, we have, uh, let's say, fitted this parameter of the probability of infection and probability of recovery from the OpenABM model, but the belief propagation uh, framework is very rich, and in principle, we can minimize the, the associated beta-free energy to learn these parameters. And this is something that seems to work, and we are going in this direction. Uh, plus, we really like to maybe test this strategy against other COVID-19 model, maybe more realistic when you have, for instance, new variants or you have vaccinated individuals. Uh, and perhaps, well, we, we, we would like to, to, let's say, implement these on real apps for contact, contact tracing. So I finished and uh, I thank you for your attention and, uh, in print, and thank for you for, Paola, for the interesting presentation. Um, maybe we we are very, uh, very late, so maybe we should uh, skip uh, questions and uh, you can ask questions in the chat uh, okay. if you want. And so Anna Paola will, will answer to, to them. So um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's now move to our next speaker, Dr. Claudio Castellano from the Institute of Complex Systems at CNR. Um, Claudio will talk about uh, eigenvector localization of the adjacency and non backtracking matrices uh, in complex networks. Uh, Claudio, you can share your screen. Okay, do you see the screen? Yes, but we see the presentation mode. Presentation. Yes, just a moment. Okay, you have the floor. Okay, uh, thank you, Francesca, and thank you to the 
the scientific committee and the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to present uh, this work, which was done in collaboration uh, with Romualdo uh, Pastor Satorras. Uh, okay, uh, let me, I will tell you something about uh, uh, both the adjacency and the non-backtracking matrix uh, for a complex network. So let me start from the, um, from the uh, adjacency matrix, which is, so the, the, what we will uh, deal with is, uh, um, is uh, the problem of the largest eigenvalue, which um, plays a very important role for many, many uh, processes taking place on networks. And in particular, um, in particular for epidemic spreading, but also for other types of, of, uh, of uh, processes. And uh, uh, the other important quantity is the, uh, the associated, the eigenvector associated to the largest eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix, which is called the eigenvector centrality, which is uh, one of the most uh, used uh, measures of uh, uh, node importance in a network. Okay, so uh, one would like to know uh, what is the value for, for a, if you give me a, a, an adjacency matrix of a network, so it would be uh, uh, is, uh, useful to, to be able to, to say uh, without computing it, how big is the uh, largest eigenvalue of, of such a network? And uh, almost 20 years ago, there was a very in, important result by Chung Lu and Wu, uh, which uh, made uh, uh, exact uh, and rigorous predictions for random and correlated networks. And in particular, they showed that the, the largest eigenvalue has essentially two different expressions depending on where on on some, some uh, relationship between the square root of k max, uh, where k is the degree, k max is the degree of the largest hub in the network, and the ratio between the second and the first moment of the degree distribution. In these relations, there is also explicitly the system size. So uh, these gives predictions, uh, except for, for essentially for small, uh, for small uh, networks, uh, actually, it gives prediction for very big <laughs> networks. Uh, but uh, one can uh, one can generalize this and say, okay, in practice, this means that uh, the the largest eigenvalue is given by the maximum between, between the square root of the k max and the ratio of the second of the first moment. So. Uh, in particular, for power law networks, which have a degree distribution decaying as a, a, a power with an exponent gamma, things change depending on whether this gamma is larger than 5 over 2 or smaller than 5 over 2. And for, for, uh, um, for uh, gamma larger than 5 over 2, uh, uh, the first expression uh, uh, dominates asymptotically for large systems. Otherwise, it is the second expression which dominates. Uh, so uh, the CL, this uh, Chung Lu Wu theory works uh, for for uh, um, works very well for for synthetic networks for the if one tests this on the uh, uncorrelated uh, configuration model one finds that uh, uh, the essentially uh, uh, the prediction and the, the numerical values that one finds for um, different values of gamma in both regimes are uh, in, in very good agreement, even for, uh, for very small networks. Uh, these networks are down to, uh, if I remember correctly, a size of 100 uh, networks, uh, 100 nodes only. Uh, the problem is, now the question is, there are two different expressions. So uh, this suggests that there may be two different mechanisms behind these uh, expressions. Uh, one mechanism is very simple. So if you if you consider a, oh, sorry, uh, a star graph, uh, you can compute uh, the, the largest eigenvalue of a star graph, and you find that it is simply given by the square root of the uh, number of uh, leaves. And, uh, uh, but actually it is actually possible also to interpret uh, uh, physically uh, the origin of the other expression. So one has to uh, consider the um, k-core decomposition, uh, uh, the k-core decomposition of, uh, uh, in a complex network, which is a, an iterative process that selects uh, um, increasingly most densely uh, connected the vertices in the network. So uh, if one performs this uh, um, 
k core decomposition, uh, the, so iteratively, at some point, uh, there is a maximum uh, number of iterations after which you have that you are completely destroying the network and nothing, nothing else is left. So if you consider this maximum key core, the last core that you can, that you can uh, uh, identify with this procedure, uh, you find that for synthetic networks, it is, typic it is typically a homogeneous network. And for a homogeneous network, you know that the, a very good approximation for the largest eigenvalue is given by the average degree of this network. But uh, in, in the configuration model in these uncorrelated synthetic networks, you have a rela this relation that the la largest degree of the maximum key core, sorry, the average degree of the maximum key core is exactly given by the, the uh, ratio between the first two moment, the, the first two moments of the whole network. This is a result by Dorogovtsev and collaborators. So essentially what you have is that this, uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, CLV formula can be interpreted as, as saying that the, the largest eigenvalue of the whole network is simply given by the competition between the, these two values for these two different subgraphs. So uh, essentially what, what you have is that uh, the, uh, uh, so these subgraphs dominate, the, actually give a, 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 the whole contribution to, to the largest eigenvalue of the whole network. So uh, the fact that uh, only a subgraph uh, gives the value of the largest eigenvalue for the whole network suggests you that the principal eigenvector, the associated eigenvector uh, can be localized on those subgraphs. And in order to, to test this, one can uh, uh, calculate and consider the inverse participation ratio, which is the standard way of checking uh, localization. And uh, uh, so in, in the case the system is, the, the network is delocalized, you expect uh, this uh, uh, part inverse participation ratio to decay as n to the minus one. And if it is fully localized on a finite set of nodes, you expect this, uh, this quantity to go to a constant. If you test that on, on the configuration model, you find that for gamma larger than five over two, uh, there is a transient, but asymptotically you find uh, essentially that uh, the, uh, this quantity goes to a constant, so you have a, a strong localization. If gamma is smaller than five over two, you instead find a decay, but this decay is not with a power minus one. So it is not a delocalized, uh, system actually the system is localized uh, on on a subextensive graph and this subextensive graph is actually the, the maximum key core which is something which grows with the system side but does not grow exactly as n it grows uh, with a with an, an exponent which is smaller than n and so th essentially uh, this expression that you find for the inverse participation ratio tells you that the system is localized on the uh, maximum key core. Uh, here is, a, is an explicit check of these two different types of localizations for the two different uh, uh, values of gamma. But let me, let me uh, go on and, and pass to, to consider um, real-world networks. Uh, the unco uncorrelated configuration model is uncorrelated, locally tree-like. It has no, uh, essentially, no clustering, nothing. Uh, so, uh, what happens if you consider a large set of uh, empirical networks? This is what we did. We took uh, uh, this large set and we found that actually the chung luvu formula does not work very well. So, there are very strong de deviation from, deviations from the, the prediction. So, uh, the, the, the idea is to try to understand uh, why this happens and how is it possible to improve on the chung lu Wu formula. So as I told you before, this formula can be interpreted as saying that the largest uh, eigenvalue is given by uh, the competition between two subgraphs, the star surrounding the hub or the maximum key core. Okay, th this uh, star surrounding the hub exists also in, in generic networks. If you have a hub, you can always consider uh, the, the nodes around, the, uh, uh, so the leaves around the hub, and they will give you a contribution of equal to square root of k max. The problem is with this other, other term, because in, in generic networks, the maximum key core is still a homogeneous graph. So you can uh, say that the, the, the largest eigenvalue of the maximum key core is 
given by, is well approximated by its average degree, but it's no more true that this is equal to the square root of the, the, the ratio of the moments for the whole system. So one has to, to formulate a, a sort of modified conjecture saying, okay, let's not do this, uh, this step and, and let's stop here. So uh, let's say that the maximum key, uh, eigenvalue is given by the max between still these, the contribution of these two subgraphs, but uh, for, the, for the maximum key core, I simply uh, have to, to, to stop here and, and say that it, and calculate its average degree. Uh, okay. Um, okay, this is a, this is a, uh, it's clearly a bound, a lower bound because uh, 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 the, the, the largest eigenvalue of a subgraph is a lower bound for the largest eigenvalue of the whole system. But the, 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 the hope is that this is a tight lower bound. And actually this turns out to be true because if uh, here we have two figures, this is the one that I already uh, proposed to you. Uh, so uh, it's the comparison between empirical results and the uh, chung luvu formula. And this is the, the um, the comparison of empirical results with this new um, with this new uh, formula, this new conjecture, which works uh, uh, satisfactory well, uh, and actually, so in this way, you you learn that in, in many empirical networks, uh, uh, this localization plays a very important role, and so the 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 the, the principal eigenvector can be localized either on around the hub or in this maximum key core. And uh, you can, um, you can um, so see that there are consequences, for example, for epidemics. If you consider the SIS model, uh, which is uh, uh, so essentially, at least in some approximation, the, the epidemic threshold is given by the inverse of the, uh, of the largest eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix. And the, 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 the prevalence above the threshold is given by essentially the property of the principal eigenvector. You see that, uh, for example, in this uh, network DBpedia, which is a strongly localized around the hub, if you remove the hub, you have a huge effect. If instead you remove the maximum K core, nothing happens. On the other hand, this other network is strongly localized around the maximum K core. In this case, if you remove the hub, nothing happens. But if you remove the maximum k-core, uh, uh, there is a, 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 a sizable uh, variation. In particular, if you consider the, the susceptibility, you see a very big change. OK, this is for what concerns the, uh, the uh, adjacency matrix. Uh, the problem, I told you, uh, eigenvector centrality is uh, considered to be a, an important measure of, of, uh, of importance. But this localization that I pointed, pointed you out uh, 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 makes clear a pathology of this centrality. The problem is the following. So what is the idea behind the eigenvector centrality? The idea is that if I am, I am central, if I am connected to other central nodes. So, and this is exactly what you see here, which is the eigen, uh, eigenvalue condition. So uh, my centrality is equal to the, the uh, essentially proportional to the sum of the centrality of my uh, neighbors. The problem with if you if there is a localization around the hub, well, this essentially loses sense because why? Because the the hub is central uh, because it has many neighbors, and but these neighbors are central not because they are really central, but only because they are connected to the, the hub. So in, in this way, there is a, a, a self reinforcement, self feedback mechanism which localizes the, 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 the eigenvector centrality around the hub. But essentially, the leaves are only important because of the hub, and the hub is only important because of the leaves. So uh, the idea is to try to find a, a different, uh, um, trying to find a different um, uh, way to define a centrality which has, which has not this, uh, this uh, problem. And uh, uh, okay, this is what was done by uh, Mark Newman and collaborators. They defined the non-backtracking centrality. What is, so this is based on the non-backtracking matrix. 
which is a, a different representation of the topology of a network. Uh, essentially, uh, you you for for an uh, a, a direct uh, sorry a non directed network you uh, you um, you have to 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 uh, replace each directed uh, uh, each undirected uh, uh, edge with two directed edges, and and what you have is that this backtracking uh, non backtracking centrality. Uh, uh, it's a representation. It's so its entries depend on a pair of the virtual directed edges, and their values are zero or one. And in particular, they are one. In which case, in the case that you start from a node M and you have an edge that takes you to node L, then if the node J, so you have a delta here, so J must be equal to L. So the two edges must be adjacent. You have a, a, a single path of length two, but also you need that uh, uh, I should be different from M, otherwise you get zero. So you need uh, that the two edges are non-backtracking. You, you cannot go back and forth along the same edge. So that's why it's called non-backtracking edge, uh, non-backtracking uh, matrix. So you can write the, the eigenvector condition for this non-backtracking matrix. And what is the, 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 the meaning of the uh, eigen of the these components of the eigenvector? Uh, the, the element uh, new j i is the centrality of node j due, uh, sorry, of node i due to node j, but disregarding the contribution of, of the nodes because there is no possibility to backtrack. And so in this way, uh, once you have this eigenvector, you can define the non-backtracking centrality as the sum for, for, a, for a given node is the sum of the centralities, sorry, of, of these components for all the neighbors. And uh, uh, okay, this was uh, was uh, defined by by Newman and collaborators. Uh, why? Uh, so essentially, to remove this problem with hubs, and actually, uh, this is uh, uh, this works well for synthetic networks, for example, because you remove completely this problem with the localization, and you can also uh, write down an, an annealed network theory and an improved theory for for calculating the largest eigenvalue of this matrix and the associated uh, uh, non-backtracking centrality. They work very well. In particular, this in improved theory, which is similar to the so-called the quenched mean field theory for the adjacency matrix, uh, gives a, a very good uh, estimates uh, for um, different values of uh, the degree distribution exponent gamma. Uh, so it, it works very well for synthetic networks. The problem is that if you try- How, to, you know, Claudio? how, ma how many? One or two at most. Ah, okay. The problem is that if you if you try to 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 check whether these uh, these uh, theories work for real uh, networks, you find a failure in different ways. But they these these uh, predictions do not work. So what is the problem? You realize uh, uh, immediately here. Oh, you realize uh, uh, realize immediately here that there is a problem uh, uh, because there is some sort of localization. So the red lines for, for, one, for these networks for which the, the predictions fail, uh, you have a, a big outlier with respect to the, to the theoretical predictions. And actually what could be, so it means that there must be some localization going on even in these systems. Uh, so what are the subgraphs which are important for these localizations? Uh, uh, now, single hubs do not play any role. You can immediately realize that this, if a single hub is connected to the rest of the network with a single uh, uh, edge, it does not give any contribution. And you, even if it's, so even the contribution, if it's, it's uh, negligible, if, you, if it's uh, um, connected with, with many networks, but there are other subgraphs which can, Play an important role, have a, a large associated eigen, non backtracking eigenvalue. Once again, dense homogeneous subgraphs, the maximum key core, and also these uh, so called overlapping hubs or complete bipartite graphs, which may arise, oh, may uh, occur in, uh, in uh, evidently, they, they, they may occur in, in real networks. And actually, if you uh, write a uh, generalized, uh, a generalized uh, uh, prediction say that uh, the largest eigenvalue is given to the uh, either the, the expression for uncorrelated networks 
or for these overlapping hubs, or for the maximum key core. These are the previous two uh, figures with the uh, fail and the, the, the prediction which did not work. And here you have a very, very good agreement. Okay, since I think I'm out of time, I'm skipping this. I, I, and I just want to, to, to say that, uh, okay, this, uh, the, the, the take home message is that uh, the, eigenvec the, the adjacency matrix uh, um, has this problem with uh, localization on subgraphs, which is very common. non taxing centrality is, is, is non uh, localized for synthetic networks, but in many real networks it is. And if you are interested in, uh, in um, uh, some uh, in reading more about this, you can uh, check out these papers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claudio, for um, this uh, very interesting and inspiring talk. Uh, we are a bit late, so I'm not sure what to do with the with the questions. Maybe we have time for a very, very, very quick one. Okay, otherwise we will uh, maybe have uh, some question at the end of the session. So, uh, okay. Th thank you very much. And uh, so let us move uh, to our last speaker today, uh, Dr. Pierpaolo Divo from King's College. And uh, Pierpaolo will talk about uh, uh, rankings and mean field first passage time uh, in complex networks. Pierpaolo, yes, hello. you have the floor, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, you should be able to see my presentation now, I hope. Can you? Yes, it's fine. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks very much. And uh, let me start by, by thanking uh, Raffaella, Davide, Alessandro, and all the uh, friends who made this nice gathering uh, possible. I will uh, uh, present uh, today a series of uh, works that I've done in collaboration with uh, Fabio Caccioli and Silvia Bartolucci now at uh, UCL and uh, Francesco Caravelli from, uh, from Los Alamos. So the overarching theme of, uh, of our uh, works is, has to do with the concept of uh, uh, dominance and in particular, we will address uh, this question, what are the most dominant nodes in a weighted and directed network? And uh, what to do, uh, can we compute this dominance concept if uh, the network itself is not known uh, very uh, precisely? This clearly requires uh, a definition or of the concept of, uh, of dominance, which can be uh, defined uh, recursively on, on a given uh, network. And I will uh, then give you uh, three examples of uh, three nice uh, incarnations of this, uh, of this concept. We will define the dominance uh, of the ith node as some constant, so something that is a bit larger than the average dominance of nodes in the neighborhood of the ith uh, node. So perhaps the most intuitive incarnation of this notion of, uh, of dominance comes from um, the field of uh, ecology, where people define the concept of trophic levels of species in, uh, in an ecosystem. The, the idea is that um, you, can, you can rank components and species of an ecosystem from uh, the plankton, for example, up to the apex uh, predators. Uh, by considering this, uh, uh, this uh, formula, you, you essentially have two ways to achieve a high trophic level. You either eat uh, a species with high trophic levels, or you eat many species with medium or low uh, trophic, trophic levels. So the definition is made in such a way that the lowest trophic level equal to one is reserved for species that don't eat anyone, but are only uh, eaten. And the trophic levels uh, defined in this way establish a, a dominance hierarchy uh, between species uh, of an ecosystem. A second completely unrelated incarnation of, uh, of this concept of, of dominance comes from the calculation of mean first passage time on, on networks. So suppose that you have a target node J and the starting node I of, uh, of a connected uh, network and you have a random walker that hops 
through the edges of the network between i and, and reaches j for the first time after a certain number mij um, of, of steps. Well, mij is the average over many realizations of this, uh, of this walker. Um, then the mean first passage time between i and j satisfies uh, a relation which is exactly of the no dominance uh, form. Why? because uh, the worker will do one step. This is the one on the right hand side of this, uh, of this relation. And then it will reach uh, a member L of its neighborhood. And then from uh, this node L, uh, we simply need to compute the mean first passage time between this new node L that has been reached with probability TIL and the target node uh, J. So this is another incarnation of precisely the same, uh, the same form as, uh, as before. And uh, the dominance of, uh, of node i in this um, context is nothing but uh, the fact that the target j can be reached fast uh, or, or slow from uh, the node i on, on average. Uh, a third example is uh, from the field of uh, economics, the so-called input-output balance uh, equation. So imagine that you have an interconnected uh, set of sectors in, in a complex uh, economy, and you can, you can write uh, an equation that uh, involves the money earned by a given sector i, which is decomposed in two uh, components. The first one, the i, is the external demand for the good that sector i produces. And the second one is essentially the, the, dollar, uh, the dollar amount that comes from all the other sectors to buy good, good I, which is needed for the production of good J, L, M, N, and so on and so, and so forth, okay? So uh, once again, uh, the, uh, this uh, input-output balance equation is again in the dominance form, and it is used to rank uh, sectors of, uh, uh, of a complex uh, economy. If uh, we, we write this linear equation in, in vector, uh, vector matrix uh, form, we have that the solution of, uh, of this uh, system for the money earned by a given sector, or alternatively for the amount of good that each sector produces, uh, is given in terms of this fundamental matrix, identity minus the interaction matrix, all raised to the, to the power minus one, applied to the vector of external demand. And if the external demand is, is unity, this gives rise to what, is, uh, to what is called in economy, the Leontief multipliers. Leontief multipliers are essentially the dominance uh, rankings of uh, economic uh, sector. But this mathematical structure, identity minus the interaction matrix to the, to the minus one is common to all dominance relations that I've shown uh, before and to many other, to many other uh, situations that I will uh, illustrate uh, later. So um, the vector of uh, dominance values, I repeat, is, uh, is obtained by performing this operation. You have a certain matrix uh, A, you compute I minus A to the minus one, and you apply it to the vector of uh, units. Um, this uh, object has a very nice interpretation, for example, in the context of uh, economics, but you can, you can draw the same conclusion for all other, uh, all other fields and examples that I've given you before, uh, because you can expand formally this, uh, this resolvent, this inverse matrix in, in a power uh, series. And you will see that each term in this, in this series has um, an interesting economic uh, interpretation. The, uh, imagine that there is like an increase in external demand of a certain, of a certain item, then the first identity term um, represents the direct increase in output of all sectors that is needed to meet this increase in final demand. The second term uh, in this series represents the increase in output that is needed to meet the increment in input that is needed by all other sectors to meet the increase in final, uh, in final demands. And, and so on and so forth, the, the chain of Kth uh, order relationship in this complex economy or in, in any other uh, examples is encoded in the K plus one terms of this, uh, uh, of this expansion. Now, what are the problems with this mathematical, uh, mathematical expression for the dominance uh, rankings in, in whatever field or, uh, uh, yes, in whatever field you, you, you have them? First of all, you may have that the inversion of this matrix 
is numerically difficult or it may be inaccurate for large uh, systems. It may happen that, that the matrix A is, is ill-conditioned and, and this will give rise to numerical problems in, uh, in computing the, the dominance rankings. You may have a problem in analytical calculation if your matrix A depends on some parameters. So it has a parametric dependence um, because due to the nonlinear relation between the matrix A and the dominance uh, values, uh, it may be difficult to infer the uh, parametric dependence of the dominance vector on the, uh, the parameters uh, the matrix A depends, depends on. Uh, but the main, the main problem uh, here is that in many uh, situations of practical interest, uh, it is the network itself in terms of structure and weights that is not, uh, that may not be known or may, may be known only, uh, only partially. And this is a big, a big problem because if you don't know the precise structure and weights of, of the network, how can you infer the dominance uh, relations on, on, that, uh, on that network? That's the problem that we are uh, trying to address in, in full generality, namely to determine the dominance of, of nodes, even if approximately, but accurately, uh, using, if possible, only local information about, uh, about uh, nodes. So uh, foregoing completely or mostly the uh, knowledge uh, about the, the, the detailed and accurate knowledge about the interaction, the interaction matrix. Now, um, the, uh, this mathematical structure that is derived from this basic uh, dominance uh, equation has some, some or requires some, some constraints that in practice are always uh, verified on the matrix A. The matrix A is always non-negative and very often it is row substochastic, meaning that the, the sum of each row is smaller than, uh, than one. Uh, this situation, this mathematical framework applies to open economies, dissipative ecosystems, where, where you have dissipation of, uh, of mass into the, uh, of biomass into the environment. The same mathematical structure appears in a Google PageRank algorithm to determine the uh, importance of, of web pages. Um, to determine nodes uh, and rank them according to the cat's uh, centrality and in many other many other fields. So it is it is really uh, a very general uh, very general framework. And um, to to establish a bit of a notation, we will call Z i uh, the sum of the ith row of the interaction matrix uh, A. So our, uh, our result is that in, in many cases and of practical interest under certain conditions, the health Leontief coefficient or the health dominance uh, value can be predicted uh, by this simple uh, formula, uh, where ZL is the sum of the health row of the interaction matrix and Z bar is the average over all these, uh, these sums. So this result is, uh, is quite uh, interesting, perhaps a bit uh, counterintuitive, and it is very, very useful because it does not require the detailed knowledge about the uh, interactions or about the, the full structure of the matrix A, but only some information about locally, uh, about what each, each node is, is seeing in its, uh, in its neighborhood, okay? Um, so, to understand the, the so our result uh, comes from a random matrix uh, formulation of the problem, which I don't have time to, to go deeply into uh, the details of, uh, but to give you the gist uh, of our result, it essentially comes from a rank one approximation for the interaction matrix. We know that the first row has some Z1, the second row has some Z2 and so on and so forth. So what we do is we distribute these sums evenly uh, across the columns of the matrix. So uh, we, we create a rank one matrix uh, whose columns are all identical and they are all equal to Z1 over N, Z2 over N, Zn uh, over N. So if this were the, uh, the correct um, form of the matrix A, then the Leontief uh, inversion could be computed exactly using the sherman morrison uh, formula, uh, which is uh, useful exactly to compute uh, the inverse of a matrix that is the sum of identity plus rank one uh, 
uh, matrix, and we would get exactly the, the formula that I showed you uh, before with no approximation. So what we managed to show using a random matrix formulation of, of the problem is that the same, the same formula holds true uh, to, to leading order uh, if the matrix A, the rank one approximation, is perturbed by um, as a, a, a random matrix uh, with sufficiently small uh, variance, okay? So I, I will not get into the technical uh, details about, uh, about that. Uh, and I will explain you just a bit later the uh, physical implication of this condition on the variance of the noise uh, of the noise term. We, we can, uh, I can present a, a few uh, results. Uh, here we have uh, a plot, a scatter plot of uh, Leontief coefficients for uh, economies. So each, uh, each point represent in, in the space of uh, our formula and empirical um, uh, inversion of the uh, technology matrix uh, A, which is uh, available. So there are input output matrices uh, that are collected uh, regularly um, by international uh, organization. So each, uh, each point here represents a Leontief coefficient relative to one sector of one specific country uh, in uh, a given year out of uh, 35 sectors 39 countries and 17, 17 years. And you can see that uh, the, the, the data, especially after some suitable uh, binning, follow very closely uh, this, uh, this theoretical uh, modeling, this theoretical rank one uh, approximation. And they do even more if uh, we take the average value of the Leontief coefficient or the dominance uh, coefficients over uh, very, um, very, uh, different uh, sectors. So each point represent uh, a single uh, a single country. And you can see that the, the agreement, not only in terms of the relative rankings, but literally in terms of the values, the numerical values is, uh, is, very, uh, is very striking. Mm. In, in this plot, we are collecting the economic, economic data um, data about the cut centrality on, uh, on uh, net social networks, uh, page rank uh, multiplier like uh, coefficients, um, and uh, data about uh, trophic, uh, trophic levels uh, in a synthetic model of, uh, of an ecology. And you can see that more or less the, the prediction of this simple-minded uh, rank one model uh, actually are very much uh, in, uh, in, in agreement with what we, uh, what we see empirically uh, without the need of uh, a very sophisticated um, analysis or knowledge of the underlying uh, matrix. Here, One uh, I, yes, here I, I, I put the, the data that are, um, that are uh, uh, where the data are taken, uh, are taken from. So, and, and here I have results for the uh, scatter plot of mean first passage time on weighted fully connected graphs and weighted uh, Erdos-Rainy graph uh, away from the high sparsity uh, regime. And uh, again, um, our approximate formula um, compares very well with exact uh, inversion of the uh, transition uh, tra identity minus transition matrix uh, for the random walk on this kind of, uh, uh, of networks without the need of, of knowing precisely the, the, the topology and, and the dynamical rules that the random walk is following in going from I to, to J. Just to, to say, uh, finally, uh, the accuracy of our formula, uh, which may also go wrong, of course, is determined by the spectral gap of the matrix uh, A, the spectral gap between the perron frobenius eigenvalue and the blob of all the other eigenvalues. This is an example uh, for the case of mean first passage time and the transition matrix uh, of the corresponding um, uh, worker, uh, depending on the connectivity uh, C. So uh, the, the blob of eigenvalues invades the complex plane as the connectivity decreases. So, and this uh, leads to the spectral gap um, to, um, to uh, close, close down. And the fact that the spectral gap determines the accuracy is not surprising because if the rank one approximation were correct, 
uh, then we would have n minus one eigenvalue exactly sitting at zero and only one isolated Perron Frobenius eigenvalue somewhere on the real and positive semi-axis. Uh, semi Our results shows that this approximation ho keeps holding through if the blob invades a slightly bigger uh, uh, size uh, of the uh, of the complex uh, of the complex plane. So my time uh, is up. We have some improvement of our results where we also include the information about the columns, not just the rows. But I'll skip just to the conclusions. Uh, we uh, I've shown that the resolvent or Leontief matrix for substochastic and spectrally gapped data follow some universal statistical regularity, which is derived from a rank one uh, approximation. And the final formula for the dominance ranking, uh, whatever field uh, or whatever sector or application uh, this, this comes from, is, is simple and elegant and does not require any matrix inversion or detailed knowledge about the interaction matrix. Deviations or fluctuations around this, uh, uh, this flat one uh, model, well, are due to deviations from, from the flat, which is the rank one model. And these fluctuations can be mitigated, can be reduced, including information about column sums, not just row, row sums. Um, these are the references of the three uh, preprints. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any question if uh, this is allowed. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Pierpaolo, for the interesting talk. Um, uh, we are late, but I think that uh, our speakers can stay maybe a little bit more during the coffee break if someone wants to ask uh, a question, some questions. And uh, so, um, okay, now there is a virtual coffee break and poster session starting, followed by the assembly of the members of the SIESF. And uh, so before moving to the question uh, of uh, session, uh, let me thanks again um, all the uh, all the speakers uh, of this session uh, and also um, the organizers and all participants and so enjoy the rest of the conference and thank you all for coming and um, I don't know if we are allowed to ask questions uh, now in parallel with the with the coffee break Raffaella what do you think of course yes Okay, uh, one, one more thing, uh, Claudio had to go and uh, told me that if someone has questions for him, can uh, ask tomorrow or, or write an email. Okay. So, uh, since you are still here, I will ask uh, both of you a quick question. So, uh, Pierpaolo, have you uh, thought about um, apply this to uh, generalized page rank uh, algorithms like, such as uh, those used in um, recommendation uh, uh, algorithms? Or... I, uh, yeah, I, th I think um, some of it is in the is in the pipeline, but we haven't uh, we haven't looked at it uh, uh, we haven't looked at it uh, yet. Um, of course, I mean all all, all depends in, on on whether you can recast uh, essentially the, the problem exactly in this in this uh, matrix inversion uh, inversion form. So identity minus some mat some substochastic matrix to the to the minus one, which I believe you can in the case you. Um, in the case you well, not really because in that off. case, uh, I'm I'm not sure because in that case you have um, random walks with restart. So instead of uh, putting your uh, walker in a random node, you put it in a random node in a subset of your graph. So it's not quite that. Yeah, yeah it's, it, it is. It is not exactly the same. The same setting. Um, we can handle with some. Uh, with with some relatively small modification, a, a bit a larger class of uh, of, of models, but um, yeah, I, I will not commit. I will not commit to a definite uh, yes, but uh, it, yeah, it's that, an, that will be interesting. So. It's an interesting thing uh, thing yeah. to 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 look at. Let let me let me stay on the safe on the safe side. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, thank you very much. And um, Anna Paula, just it's just a, a general question. I was thinking about uh, digital tracing. Do you think that digital tracing uh, can work without uh, support from traditional uh, human assisted tracing or, or not? What is your opinion on that? Human assistance, you mean basically the manual contract tracing? I mean, the. Yeah. Well, with, I mean, the, the fact that uh, there is actual people going to look at uh, the contacts and uh, uh, act on oh, that. Yeah, of course. I mean, yes, of course. I mean, that, I think that you, you can really avoid this step. And uh, because basically all the information that you have, you can store in uh, some, let's say, servers. And doesn't mean and doesn't you doesn't need that uh, all information as mm, needs to be centralized in one let's say server and plus let's say the iteration that you need in order to uh, to let the main algorithm converge so belief propagation can be performed basically in all the smartphones so the server like sends let's say the incoming messages the common belief propagation propagation messages in each of the smartphone then the computation can be basically delocalized completely and each smartphone can give this belief propagation messages of, I mean as a, an output of the iteration so you, you can basically store the de localize all the store information and plus you can delocalize also the computation and, and plus I mean this is very automatic in the sense I mean since you have the risk and you you the, the risk estimate like computed every day um, then it's, it's very automatic. You, you have some, maybe you have to fix some parameters like, I don't know, how many times, how many days you consider when you compute the risk, so on and so forth, but this can be set at the beginning. And uh, say the human intervention is not, uh, uh, let's say, necessary in the, the main steps of all the inference. Okay. Um, what do you think is a realistic uh, threshold for, for adoption? Because if the, the main argument against digital tracing has been that uh, suppose that you reach a 10% uh, adoption rate, then uh, the chance that you detect a contact is 10% times 10%, so it's very low. Um, and there yeah, this was, is very low. In the days of pandemic, there was this number of uh, 60%, which was uh, uh, as, uh, given as an estimate, but... Yeah, so of course, this, I mean, let's say that I cannot really answer to the, this question because we have tried like uh, on a, only one synthetic network, so let's say, and uh, in that case, uh, well, even if it works perfectly, if you have 90% of adoption, but then if you start having like 80, per 80 or 70, it doesn't work very well. I mean, in order to stop it, but then if you add maybe some other measures like, uh, I don't know, I mean, this context is really like free. So you don't take into account, I don't know, uh, local lockdowns, or maybe you have, I don't know, contacts that, that come from, uh, like, let's say, workplaces like Beacon. So you put, uh, like a machine that sends, like a, a collect, the, the, say the presence of individuals, uh, and it's like a collective notes, for instance, that like uh, uh, try to understand who is where in a, at a certain time. This maybe simplify a little a, a lot. Like uh, uh, okay, but I mean uh, anyway. Um, uh, this is, I mean, the adoption fraction is like a crucial point. I, I think it is the, the, the largest it is, the better it is, of course. And, uh, but I, I can really say to you what will be, let's say, in a realistic scenario, because, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, like every, also contacts between individuals nowadays are really changed are changing i mean we 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 don't meet each other very frequently and uh, uh, you have these all these additional measures that change a lot so i, I cannot really tell thank you very much Nick, say something francesca hi hi just one minute uh, i have i am obliged to recall to the associate of sifs that we are going to meet on another link for the General Assembly, but for those who are not uh, participating,
they can go on discussing as long as you want. Nobody will prevent you to go on. Because I want to thank all of you. That was really a great session. I was really interested in attending everything. But every time we are so tight with these things that it would be very nice to have time to discuss with you. But we hope next year to see in person and possibly to have uh, longer speeches altogether, not in these uh, strange conditions. Okay, thank you very much. I have to leave. Bye.